what they're doing. They're, they're just building. You know, I said things got worse, right? Each chapter, you, and so they're showing you what happens, uh, where your variation shows up. And so it's, I thought it was a good figure just to kind of put things in perspective. So, so this is chapter one and chapter two. Well, chapter one is done, it's the introduction. But chapter two, we have a single factor. So our, our total variation in the y is going to come from two things: random variation from experimental error, and the variation among the treatment. Exactly. I put X at 10%, 20%, 30%, 40%, and Y varied. And oh yeah, there was also variation in there because of random experimental error. So that's all we got in chapter two. Alrighty, then we're going to go to chapter three. Okay. Oh look, we had the same thing as chapter two. We had random and we had the difference in the treatment. Oh, but wait a minute. Remember chapter three? We had these background variables and we had to put them into blocks. So we've also got some variation due to the blocks, right? Because the background variables are different. So, so when we ask our question of ANOVA, our statistical question, we're asking ourselves, in, in the previous case, in chapter two, how big is this compared to that? If this is big compared to that, oh, the treatment matter. Well, here we're gonna ask, how big is this compared to that? And how big is this compared to that? You know, and, and, and we're gonna ask that statistically with a p-value. And if it comes out that this is, this is more than that, this is more than that, oh, this matters. That's what we're asking, right? Does this matter? Oh, well, maybe, maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. Okay, then we went on to chapter four. Remember chapter four, it got worse. Why? Because we had more than one factor. So now we've got, still got random variation. We're always gonna have random variation, right? This is just experimental error. It's always gonna be there. But oh, now we have differences among the treatments. We don't just have treatment uh, with factor A only. Oh, we got factor, the main effects of factor A, we're varying it. We've also got factor B or maybe factor C, D, E, and F, but you know, this is, this is one, one thing where, this is the dial, one dial, this is the other dial, and oh yeah, they're gonna to interact too. So now we're going to have to ask ourselves, how does this one compare to that? How does this one compare to that? How does that one compare to that, right? Because well, this one may matter, this one may matter, or this may trump them all. And so we were going to have to ask that statistically. Well, that's okay. You know, we'll just, we'll still use the ANOVA. We'll still ask the question statistically. We'll just ask it of each, each one. And then finally, chapter five, uh, okay. Well, we've got more than one factor. We still have random error. And oh goodness, yeah, darn it. We've got more than one factors and we've got blocks too. So, so. So, you know, here we'll use ANOVA one way, here we'll use it another, here we'll use it still another, and then here another. But either way, we're still asking ourselves the statistical question, how do these variations compare to these and these and these and these? And then after that, you know, chapter six and seven and eight and nine, you just build on this uh, same structure, we just have different conditions, whether we had the 2F or the 3F or incomplete blocks or, do we have aliasing or things like that? So, so that's really, uh, um, uh, you know, what, what we'll wind up having to do. Now, let's see. So let me give you another example, um, just, just for fun, and we can, you know, help us discuss. So, uh, so one of the things I, I participated in, in in every, which you can't see that hardly, so I'm blow that up a bit, uh, was two years ago, we entered the Google Little Box Challenge. I think I've talked about this before in class, where uh, Google had wanted to take a, a, an inverter, a DC to AC inverter that, you know, two kilowatt or two kVA that's normally about this big and make it this big. Because, uh, you know, if you can do that, then you, you can open up some doors in, uh, in uh, renewables, you can open up doors in electric cars, you can improve performance in computing centers. There's a lot of reasons why you want to do that. So Google, being Google, being brilliant, said that we'll offer a million dollar prize for the company that can come up with the best, uh, the most efficient and most compact inverter. Uh, and so they had like 120 people enter, which is, is just brilliant to me. You know, I'm gonna give you a million dollar prize and I'm gonna get 120 different companies to enter this. It's probably each of them spent half a million dollars designing this dumb thing. So, you know, what do they get? They got $50 million worth of research or $25 million worth of research or whatever equivalent for their little million dollar prize just because they're Google, it was great, it's a great idea, you know. So, so anyway, one of the big challenges was uh, 
shrink this thing down and, and, and you know if I'm gonna make an inverter in fact I'll bring it next week if I'm gonna make an inverter this big that's two kilowatts and it's 98 percent efficient that still means I put 40 kilowatts in this little box and if I'm gonna stick this little box inside you know like a vehicle or inside a cabinet it's gonna be hot that can get real hot 40 watts in a tiny little box is, is, is a lot and so they have requirements on efficiency requirements on uh, uh, you know how it performed electronically obviously you know could, could it could it spit out 120 and could it do it at certain uh, frequency restrictions <coughs> things but one of the big requirements which you can't see very well was the temperature requirement and that's the part I worked on they had to be less than uh, 60 degrees C uh, on each of the surfaces or uh, you know it's going to be a fire hazard and then also, in our case, it had to be less than like 120 inside, or it's going to start melting our things, you know, our electronic components and our wires. This is bad too. So, uh, so we we built uh, we built a finite element model of this this, this uh, uh, inverter. And in fact, the finite element model has all the components in it. It has the the, the inductors. It has all the little uh, mem mem you know memory chips. It has all the little switches. Everything you would have in a, in a uh, um, an inverter, and then they each have their own associated power losses. That some of them were actually a function of temperature, function of you know what what operating level you were doing. And then we did a zillion experiments. What are the experiments? Well, they're, they're runs of my finite element model, right? And each run had tons of data. What data did it have? Well, it had uh, temperatures of some of the critical components, like some of the, the switches. Uh, it had surface temperatures, right? All six surfaces it had to be less than 60. So, so you can see with, with having this finite element software, I, I could quickly and, and, and accumulate a pile of data. And, and I could perhaps um, in, in general contr control my background, right? Because this is a finite element. I could set what things I want. But I, I could have a bunch of designed experiments. So, so, so I was going to, you know, in, 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 a, in, a, in order to think. And turn that off. Well, it's fine. Yeah. So, so to, to fit within our, our, our class to understand what uh, uh, variables would be and what the uh, treatments would be and what the air, uh, noise would be, I sort of listed them. So, so, so for example, uh, uh, my temperature uh, on, on, say, one of the surfaces uh, was a function of a lot of things, right? It was a function of, of the power loss of, of things, whether it's the GAN or the computer chip or, or something. It's a function of the airflow, okay, and it's a function of the ambient temperature, all right, and it's a function of the size of the thing, right? And then it's, et cetera, like, you know, this is a function of the, the grills and holes I poked in, it's a function of the fans, it's a function of, you know, the baffles and things that I routed around the red was getting bad. Uh, so it's a function of a lot of things. And then, uh, so, 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 let's look at this. So, so my response variable, which is, which is the one we're caring about, right, is a temperature of the surface. And this is a vector, right, it's each surface. There, there's six of them in there. And then also the sum of the temperature of the electronics. So if, if you will look at, you know, you look at some of my results, that doesn't look good either. Um, uh, I, I would do a spider plot, you know, of the surface and the electronics picture so that I, you change a treatment and you see the thing grow real quick. So those are my response <laughs> variables. And then, you know, my factors, my factors, which are the things, remember this is Y, right? And this is X, the things that make the response variable work. Well, we just, we, we run them, right? There's some power losses in each of the items. There's the flow, so maybe, uh, you know, volumetric flow. Okay. And then I got the ambient temperature. Holes. Okay. Oh, oh, look, I got the emissivity for radiation. That matters, by the way, these temperatures. Uh, and then the, uh, Baffles and things inside. Sorry, baffles inside. You know, how do I route the flow? Okay. Dr. Chris. Yeah. 
how did you go about identifying all your factors? Well, um, that's, a, that's a nice question. Uh, w one way you would know some of them, right? Like, oh, well, gee, of course it's power loss. <laughs> I never would have thought of emissivity, though, so. E exactly. And, and so, and I didn't either. In fact, in fact, I said, oh, hell with that. It's not radiation. That's not going to matter. And so, after a while, you know, once I caught a model that I trusted and started playing with things, I said, well, let's put some radiation in there. Just, just in case somebody said, you know, I got ahead of the curve, I had five minutes, and I tried it. I was like, oh, well, it does matter. Oh, gosh. And then, and then I was like, well, am I right? Uh, you know, so I had to, I, that's a good one. I had to play with it. Changing emissivity, see, did it matter? Yeah, it did. Uh, and then I started to have do a few little experiments on what, what was the emissivity, you know, because I didn't know any. I was, I, at first, I just made it up. So, so the answer to that is some were obvious, duh, you know, power loss and airflow. Some weren't obvious, and so you, so I had to do some little experiments to figure out where they, did they matter. Yeah, so you're right, and and uh, guess what too? Uh, I forgot a keyword, and randomly got reminded of it by one of our junior engineers. We were talking, and he just said, "Where where are they doing? Where are they going to test this thing? Because we actually built it and actually tested it as part of the contest." And they're testing it in Denver. He goes, "Well, you know, the air pressure there is a lot lower than it is here." And the density of the air is going to be different. I'm like, yeah, it is. You're right. And, and Randolph said, well, how much difference does that make? It was, it was huge. Two or three degrees difference, which is a big deal if you're designing to the darn limit. And so basically that caused me to redesign the entire heat sink over one weekend to account for that. And you know, that, so that was a random conversation with somebody. So yeah, I found my factors by that pop. Good, good. I'm glad I talked to our junior engineer who thought of that and I didn't. And so, so, so the combination of experiments and thinking and experience. And so, yeah. Uh, so let's see. Uh, some of the nuisance variables or the noise uh, were, were the, uh, you know, the electromagnetic losses. Uh, because a lot of times they, those were hard to quantify. And maybe I'd have one, we had several different inductors. One would have a certain amount of loss and then you switch it out and put the next one in. It would have different losses. Because you know it was different, made from a different material, different you know, slightly different material. So so that was a uh, 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 one of the sources of random error and the switch losses uh, in in the um, in the electronic switching. Those very and those were temperature dependent. And that was I couldn't quantify that. So sometimes that that introduced random error between my experiments, if you will. And then and then the background, uh, you know, of course, would be the ambient temperature, which they, uh, I had to vary that because they were unable to tell us that it was going to be exactly this. So I had to, you know, use the maximum stuff like that. And so, so then when you start looking, um, um, what what did I have? I also, as part of my things, I had a heat sink design. You know, was it thin? Was it pinned? Uh, did I buy a commercial one? Did I make a custom one? Um, you know, where do I put it? How do I hold the heat sink down? That was a, that was a big deal. Because you can't just screw it in there, you know. You got to have thermal pads and thermal con conducting grease between them. Because if you don't have good, you know, connection there, we'll make the best heat sink and blow the biggest fan on you want. If you're not getting the heat from your, you know, your chip to the heat sink, well, what have you done? <laughs> done nothing. You're wrapped in insulation. <coughs> and so one of the things I did, um, uh, I actually, believe it or not, uh, used this stuff. So you know, this stuff is is is, is actually worthwhile. Uh, I actually used one of these, these Latin square techniques you'll learn about. So, so I did a Latin square on this. In fact, I'll bring the results in when we, when we get it. So I used a Latin square um, and I had the, uh, two, two different power losses here and I had two different um, uh, emissivities over here. And then I also did one of those uh, um, uh, two F experiments too. I did another one with a power loss, the electrical uh, resistivity, and the free area of the grills. So I did power loss, uh, the, the thermal re resistance, and then the, yeah, the, how big, so the airflow here, how big of a grill I had. So I've actually applied some of this stuff to some of the results and it, it worked. So it's this inter interesting little project. Uh, and I'll bring, I'll bring our little box in for you. And so let's see. Nova is analysis of variance. 
So remember that too. When we get there. <laughs> all right. So that's 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 all I got for today. So did you bury the thermal paste? Or no, but I buried. Uh, I picked the best thermal paste I could, and I buried um, the pad. They had two two kinds of pads. They had these little thermal pads that were like basically spongy, like double sticky tape, and soft. And then they had this uh, iridium foil that you could put in there. So I did bury that, and we varied how we uh, held it together. Um, one, one solution was to put a thing in the lid that pushed down on the heat sink. Yeah. Basically, basically screw the heat sink to the lid and put it down that way. And I didn't like that at all. So my approach was to, to fuss at the board designers to say, you want guys, you got to give the candle guys a break too. Can you drill some holes in your board and let me put some screws on my, on my heat sink? And then, then we had to worry about how, how, what torque was bad. You have on it because, you know, too much. Crack your stupid board, and you're, you know, we're, we're due to be tested next week. <laughs> so, so we had that issue. So we wound up the iridium foil wasn't the best choice. The best choice was just the simple old thermal grease and the little, the regular, the best. I bought the best thermal pads you can find. Best being the, the highest thermal company, and stick them in there. And the reason for that was too, the board manufacturers had a hard time getting the chips. We had, we were setting the heat sink down on four chips in a row. They had a hard time getting them left. Believe it or not, so just because you think you got four chips on board, that's not a nice way to service. And so we had to have the pad. The iridium foil was too thin. The pad had to be soft enough to take up the mechanical variation of the darn uh, uh, heat sink relative to those chips. Now the nice thing was nobody was believing this. You know, I was doing all the fine and I was all all the electrical guys were like, "This is crazy. This isn't working." Until uh, right near the end, I mean, they were trusting it, <laughs> and right near the end, of, uh, three months before we were supposed to go test, we, we got an undergraduate student, we were working with UT, random guy showed up uh, as an undergraduate for some summer program. Well, I've got to have something to do, and they said, hey, why don't you take this design we've got and solder in resistors uh, to, 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 to match the power loss of each of the things, we'll blow some current through there, we'll just have dumb resistors in there. And, each correspond to the loss of each of these components, and we'll put the heat sink on there, and let's, let's measure the temperatures. And it, it turned out really, really close to what I was showing in simulation. So they were like, well, gee, I guess this stupid final <laughs> <laughs> stuff really works. And so then there was, there was some confidence, and, and so it did. And it, it did predict it well, but we didn't win. We made it into the finals. We were, we were the, there was only, uh, No, no, about 15 teams that made it. To, to make it into the finals, you had to meet the basic specs. You had to have two kilowatts, and you had to not set it on fire, and all this stuff. And so we made it to the finals. <laughs> it's important. Yeah, but but we didn't uh, we didn't win because believe it or not, uh, we didn't even. It's like like training all for the Olympics forever, and then getting on the start line is you know spraining your ankle. Um, we we had an experimental board we were using that had a a flexible part to it that you bent up over, uh, so it sort of fitted in the box, and a piece of it bent up over. That broke. Mm -hmm. uh, I know. So so here we were. We, we were actually, <laughs> we looked at our data, we were actually fairly competitive. We might have finished maybe third, but we finished nowhere because, you know, when it got there, it broke, you turned it on, and it, it didn't do anything. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> I know. So I was saying, I reached the Olympics, get on the starting line, you know, you trip on, you trip on up to the starting block, and okay, I can't do nothing. That's yeah. sad. But we learned a lot. It's fun. So I bring the box in because I built a little a, a fake box to you know to test things. In. So yeah. But uh, anyway, it didn't work. And the design out. And when we get to the chapter, I'll bring in the design of experiments thing. I bring in some of that stuff. So it's fun cool. stuff. Who? Uh, what company? I'll look at that too. It was a German company. I believe. Yeah, they do. They do this thing. Oh, they kick butt too. I mean, we were like 